So hello everyone. My name is Charles Banfield and I'm the founder of Karate Canucks and I'm back with another in our series of conversations with prominent Canadian martial artists. The goal of this video series is to capture stories, insights and opinions on various topics related to the Canadian martial arts experience. And today I'm pleased to be joined by Sensei Earl Robertson. Uh, Sensei Robertson has over a half a century of martial arts experience, including boxing, Greco-Roman wrestling, Aikido, Judo, Kali, uh, Ryukyu, Kobudo, Yaido, and various systems of karate. Uh, Sensei Robertson holds black belt ranks and teaching titles in several martial arts, including the seventh dan, Kyoshi, in Jikishin, uh, Jikishin Ryu Karate, uh, sixth dan, Shihan, in Yoshikai International Karate, uh, fifth dan, in Ryukyu Kobudo, uh, fourth Dan in Sh uh, and Shidoan in Chitoryu Karate, and ranks in Kodokan Judo and Mus Muso Shinden Ryu Yaido. It's a mouthful. It did well. <laughs> um, Sensei Robertson has also served as a first vice president of Karate Ontario and as the vice chairman of the Karate Ontario Technical Committee. He's authored two books on the martial arts and hosted a community self-defense television show, which was broadcast across Canada. And more recently, in 2019, he was inducted into the Canadian Karate Association Hall of Fame. So welcome, uh, Sensei Robertson, and thank you very much for, for joining us today. Thank you. So um, that said, usually how these things go um, is uh, there's no set format. Um, but uh, I like to try and open this up with, uh, you know, asking some questions on your on your personal background. So, um, you know, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Um, and how you were how you came to the martial arts? Sure. Uh, just before I answer that, Charles, I want to give credit to you for putting this series together. Uh, we've got a a vast country, a vast history of some outstanding individuals, and I, I see you're interviewing them. So I want to give credit to you and thank you for doing this for future generations to see who the pioneers were and how they came to be who they are. And I hope everyone gives you credit for the, this extra effort you're going to, to, you know, keep this archive of, of our background. Okay. Well, I very much appreciate that. Yeah. This, this was more of a, a, um, uh, a personal, um, just personal interest and, and not boredom, but, you know, I, I always, felt like I had something that I, I wanted to, if, if, if I want to search out something and, and find out more about it, I usually just start asking questions. And I've been lucky thus far in terms of the, uh, um, the people that I've been fortunate enough to speak with, including yourself. So uh, thank you. you know, I'm, I'm what I call second generation. And what I'm, I mean by that is the original generation were the original teachers under Soroka Sensei and, you know, different systems across the country. They were all about 10 or 15 years older than me. And unfortunately, we've, we've lost many of them now. So I'm, I'm the second generation. I started my martial arts training in 1969. And uh, uh, my, my parents had given me a membership to a YMCA for Christmas. So I, you know, I wandered into the Y and uh, saw all these guys and, you know, they're their white uniforms throwing each other on the mat. And boy, if ever there was something that was truly love at first sight, that was it. And I played a lot of sports. I came from a very athletic family. So we played football, rugby, hockey, basketball, you name it. But this was, you know, this was love. So I, uh, I, I you know, quickly became a, a, an advocate of judo and studying the arts. And, and of course, the more you study the art, the physical side of the art, the more you realize that there's a whole philosophical side to the art and a set of ethics and behavior and so on. And, and so that was, was uh, my, my formation. And concurrently at the YMCA, there was a karate club. And the instructor's name was Mike Litwinchuk. Mike was uh, with the RCMP, a brilliant guy, um, you know, spoke five languages. He'd worked in their security service, which was the forerunner to the Canadian CIA or a CSIS as we call it now. And so uh, he was doing a lot of undercover work and, and, and so on. And uh, Mike taught karate and a really practical guy. You know, he came from a very rough area and karate for him was, was uh, oftentimes survival. And, uh, and I kept bugging him to join the karate club. 
And, uh, you know, he'd say, you're too young, go away. You're too young, go away. And I, I do this periodically every six months. And then I went to him one day and I said, can I join the karate club? And he said, when's your birthday? I said, today. He said, okay, you can join. <laughs> and then that, that started, uh, you know, a 50 year friendship that, that uh, I still speak with him on a regular basis and, and touch base with him and have tremendous respect for everything he did for me personally, but also how, uh, how many champions he produced. He was a brilliant coach and he really understood how to bring the best out of people. So he was a great role model for me. Mm -hmm. um, after uh, about eight years with Mike, he retired. And uh, so I spent two years looking for my next teacher and uh, literally went across the country, you know, Vancouver, Calgary, Saskatchewan, you name it. I, I traveled the country looking for a teacher and was very fortunate. I met some great people trained in Kyokushinkai in Vancouver with a teacher called Ron Citra, trained in Rembukai in Calgary, uh, and so on. And then eventually met David Akutagawa. Um, for those that don't know David Akutagawa, um, he was from BC. Shane Agashi was from Toronto when the two of them were running the Canadian Chitoryu Association. Yep. And so they had a camp in 1980. And I went out with a couple of my black belts to this camp and uh, was really impressed with the Kutagawa. Fantastic technician, beautiful bunkai. And, uh, you know, right there, Kutagawa said, we'd like you to join the association. And I said, great. He said, you're going to be with Shane Agashi in Toronto. I said, wonderful. So we went out, had a few kamikazes, <laughs> which Akutagawa sensei liked, and, and I joined the association. I have to tell you, that might be the last drink I've ever had. I haven't, I haven't had a drink in 40 years. But anyway, um, so I came back and I started training with Shane Agashi. And uh, Shane, uh, uh, the, those that don't know Shane, he was Soroka sensei's top teacher. He eventually split from Soroka sensei and aligned himself with Dr. Chitose in Japan. Uh, Soroka Sensei started his own system in Canada, Soroka Ryu, and Shane uh, was the Canadian representative for Chita Ryu. And uh, I have to say, to Shane's credit, he worked tirelessly. You know, he would come in regularly to Montreal. I was running a club at the NDG YMCA. I have to tell you, we recently celebrated our 50th year, uh, so one of the longest running uh, karate schools in the country. And uh, he'd come in regularly, and I used to drive just about every second weekend to Toronto. So I would drive to Toronto, uh, you know, train at, at Higashi's Friday night, Saturday, get in the car, drive back to Montreal. Um, my dojo mates at Higashi's uh, were Peter Giffen, who you've interviewed, uh, Dominic Pitto. Um, and so it was, it was just one of those, those eras when we had, you know, young bucks that were working very hard to be as good as they could be. And Shane, who I used to joke, stayed up late at night to think of tortures he could put us through. Uh, <laughs> on, on many more than one occasion, uh, he'd push me to the point that I had to run outside and throw up. Uh, that was Shane. <laughs> anyway, so we had, we had a great experience. We had a great environment. And uh, I was with Shane for many years, 17 years. And then, uh, and then I, I eventually went over to Yoshikai with Mike Foster in the States. But I'll let you get a question in here someplace. <laughs> No, this was great. And, and yeah, I wasn't aware that you had uh, trained with um, Sensei Higashi. Actually, the, the certificates that are on over my shoulder there on the wall are all signed by him. So he's, sure. uh, he's um, you know, still a force to be reckoned with um, in, in, in Chito Ryu and also in, you know, karate uh, across the country. Um, so just curious, um, you mentioned you know, you, you, you started in 69 at the YMCA. Was this, where was this? Was this in Montreal? Or was yeah, this Montreal, in NDGY? In Montreal, okay. And um, so, I'm, and I think you may have already said this in some way, but I, I, I didn't quite capture what the, what the impetus was behind it. But what, what kind of drew you to the martial arts to begin with? Like, you said it was love at first sight, but did you yeah. know what, what, what made you go to the Y to begin? Um, this. Um, well, you know, NDG, uh, NDG is Notre Dame de Grasse, Our Lady of Grace. Uh, many of us growing up there called it no damn good. <laughs> it's not true. It's a lovely area. It's become gentrified right now. It's, it's a lovely area. But when I grew up, you never knew night by night whether or not you'd be in a tussle. And so, you know, my, my impetus, like many people, and originally in the martial arts, is I have to learn how to defend myself. 
And, uh, and you do that, you know, for a few years till you, you stop thinking about that because you know you've got the ability. And uh, so, you know, that was my original impetus to the art. But I, I've said many times that I feel like the art saved my life. Uh, I could have easily gone down a path that I've seen others go down that, uh, that would have taken me in a bad direction. And the arts, the arts gave me a, a sense of direction and purpose and ethics and uh, caring about others, caring about yourself that, that I can't replace. And I know many people find this in, in various activities. You, know, you mentioned the military earlier, or other arts. But for me, I always felt that, that martial arts had an extra element to it in the sense that you're not just studying an art. There's an element of practicality there that it must be effective. And uh, over the course of my life, I, uh, I was a competitor for many years. And then I was a bouncer. And... Then I was a dojo fighter. I used to just throw my gi over my shoulder and go find a dojo and say, hey, anyone I can, I can fight with. And uh, it, it changed my perspective. I, I will tell you, when people refer to me as a martial artist, I often reply, no, I'm a fighter. I've chosen martial arts as my tools. But at its core, uh, I was a fighter. And so my interest in all the various arts was less about the art, although I, I have tremendous respect for it, respect for it but but it was really I'm a fighter is this a tool I can use and so uh, you know much of my orientation has been around the practicality of what we do and uh, you know unfortunately I've, I've had many many times to test the practicality not least of which because I I was training security forces and police forces and working in the field and you know you find out what works and what doesn't work so it was more the the practical side, the practical applications. Yeah. yeah so how how has that evolved then over time? So that that was the original impetus. Now you know you've been involved for you know over fifty years um, or so. Um, you know what is it that keeps you um, involved in it now? You know I, I'm I'm I would assume your fighting days are over. <laughs> um, as you know, I mean, from a practical point of view, you know, I would I would hope that for everyone, but uh, but um, you know, what what uh, what keeps you, what keeps driving you to to stay involved? Well, I have I have two answers for you. The first one is a, a line I heard that I love, which is, "I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was." <laughs> um, look, you know, things things evolved, and I can tell you uh, because I, I've always had a had a strong interest in teaching. I actually started my first dojo in 1974. So, uh, you know, people still thought karate was Chinese food. Um, but uh, I've always had an interest in developing others. And that, by the way, is transferred into my business career as well. But the, the thing that, that struck me was in the, in the original days, when you walked into a dojo, it was a dojo of tough guys. And the only people that survived were the tough guys. And quite frankly, they didn't need martial arts. You know, they, they were already tough guys. And uh, over time, my, my perspective evolved where I thought, well, you know, it isn't the one out of 30 that needs martial arts. It's the, it's the 29 out of 30. And our teaching has to be focused on creating an environment where everyone's skill sets do improve. There's a practical application to what they're doing. But it shouldn't be the sort of blood and guts environment I started in, where the one out of 30 stays, 29 quit, and those were the ones that really needed the arts. So uh, when I, when I uh, and I've opened up many dojos across the country, but my most recent I opened up in Mississauga, and our tagline was simply building life champions. And we had expectations of our students that how they behaved was the same inside the dojo and outside the dojo. We expected high academic uh, achievement or pursuit of excellence. Uh, we expected them to share and be supportive of, of uh, other students that are, that are working with. Uh, there's no place for meanness or bullying or, or any of those behaviors. So for us, teaching became really a foundation to say, if we teach you properly, and if you listen to the lessons and apply yourself, you will have success in life. You'll be a good citizen. You'll know how to interact with everyone. You'll, you'll, whatever your 
your dream or pursuits are, you'll be able to do it with excellence in mind. And I, I'm quite proud to say, you know, we, we produce uh, not that many, we're a small association, you know, a little over a hundred black belts, but almost to a person, they've had just outstanding lives. And, you know, many, many doctors and researchers and academicians and so on. And so we're, we're very proud of how people took the lessons from the dojo and applied it to their life pursuits. So that's, that's the ultimate goal for you now then is, 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 yeah. is, uh, is that as opposed to creating fighters more creating, you know, we, we still create fighters. <laughs> I, I, I know, but I mean, that's not the, the that's yeah, but that's not the goal. You know, I, yeah, I, yeah. an example, uh, you know, my, my daughter was a very good competitor. She was on the national team, competed at the junior Pan Ams and so on. And I would frequently say to her, listen, this, this isn't the end game. The lessons you're learning are what you're going to apply to your life. That's the end game. And, you know, she's gone on, she's got an advanced academic degree. She's had, you know, terrific business career, smart as a whip. Uh, but more importantly, that's what we expect from every student. The lessons you learn here, you should apply to your business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you just a funny little story. I, I was, uh, uh, I started my career, my business career with Procter & Gamble, and then I, I ended up going over to Xerox. And at one point, they recommended me to be a regional manager. And I was only 26 at the time, and the vast majority of regional managers were 35 to 40. And they sent me down to uh, Stanford, Connecticut, where our head office was to meet the CEO of the business. And he was interviewing me, and he said, well, you know, why should we at this young age uh, put you in this position? And I said, well, I have to tell you, I, you know, I have a martial arts background. I've been studying martial arts and teaching martial arts for many years. And uh, one of the things I've learned is that whatever someone does, they can do a little bit more. <laughs> they can do just a little bit more. And I said, it's not about, you know, not recognizing achievement. Of course you do it, but it's always, okay, what's the next level? How do we grow and stretch together? And he looked at me and said, you've got the job. And it was a reflection, I think, of the fact that, that what we do in a martial arts dojo really does translate into outside life. And that there are people that recognize the type of discipline and perseverance uh, that's involved are really human qualities that they should be able to display in their regular lives. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that echoes a lot with um, my first... Um formal uh, karate instructor uh, is a gentleman named um, Terry Walsh based out of Orangeville, Ontario. And uh, when, when we were, we were looking for a place for our son to enroll him into, you know, some form of martial arts training, wh whether it's karate or, or whatever else. And um, what, what he said, one of the things that he said that really resonated and actually it's echoed in, in what you're saying is that, you know, he, 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 um, he indicated that, his dojo is not in the karate business. It's in the potential business, yeah, the right. potential business. So yeah, that, that sounds very much like what, uh, yeah, what you good, good for him. Good for him. Yeah. So, um, in the introduction, I had listed off a, a number of different, um, martial arts, you know, ranks and titles and so on that you hold. Um, do you want to share a little bit about, you know, who, who your influencers are in in those, or who your who your um, your instructors and so on are sure. have been? Um, Absolutely. Well, you know, I'll uh, I'll reference first my my karate instructor right now, Masaru Inamoto. Uh, Inamoto Sensei was Dr. Chitose's right hand man for forty years. He lived around the corner from him in Kumamoto. I've been I've been there many times, by the way. I I was I think probably inspired by Peter Giffen who had been mm. to Japan so many times. And I said, okay, I got some work to do. Uh, so now I've been there many times and every experience has been marvelous. But uh, Inamoto Sensei um, studied various arts and all from the Hanchi 10th Dan. So he's, uh, he's a 10th Dan in karate. He's an 8th Dan in Yaido. He's an 8th Dan in Kobudo. Uh, he's a 5th Dan in Jukendo. He's got black belts in a variety of arts. And every one of his teachers is the founder or the senior teacher in the system. So when he left Dr. Chitose, um, he named his system Jikshin Ryu. And Jikshin means straight from the heart. <laughs> so he's just capturing that in fact, 
uh, all the arts he teaches are, have really come you know, right from the senior teacher in the art. Uh, wonderful guy, uh, really wonderful guy. I've known him you know, probably 40, 50 years. And uh, fortunately, the Kobodo system he trains in, Ruku Kobodo Hosen Shinkokai, uh, is the same system my uh, weapons teacher, Deborah Dimitrich, studies. Both of them trained under uh, Akamine Eske, who was the, the 10th Dan senior Kobodo teacher in Okinawa, who was directly under Shinkin Taira. So when you go back in your lineage, you'll find Shinkin Taira, his Okinawan senior teacher was uh, Akamine Sensei. And Akamine Sensei's two students were Inamoto Sensei and Deborah Dimitrich Sensei. So when she came uh, back to Kentucky, because she was with the military and spent a lot of time over there, uh, I've, I've been training with her now for many, many years. Uh, incredible teacher, uh, incredible. She's a ninth Dan Hanchi uh, in our system. And uh, it, it, you know, I, I had looked at Kobodo for many years and I'd studied Kobodo for many years, different teachers. And then I saw Dimitri Sensei and I, I, poof, oh my God. All of a sudden, every weapon was a weapon. You know, in North America, we have a tendency to towards the fancy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we do a weapon and weapon kata and so on. And more often than not, people are choking up on the weapon and they're twirling it like a baton. And it looks very impressive, but there's no real practical combat application to it. When Dim Dimitri Sensei uses a weapon, you're saying, I, I don't want to be on the end of that. That will kill me. Like it's just, it's that beautiful coordination of technique and uh, hip rotation and power, it's, it's marvelous. So I feel very fortunate uh, to be what's called a Shibu. I'm one of her senior teachers in her system across North America. And we, uh, you know, we, we train regularly. I, I do online classes with her every second week right now. Yeah. So what, what is your favorite implement then? Is it the bow or is it uh, something else? I, I, I like Iku, I like the oar. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. The or the or encompasses a lot of different aspects to it. It's it's like a Joe bow. It's between the length of a Joe and a bow. Uh, it's got an edge to it, like a bokto, like a like a sword. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got it's it's got many different elements to it. And uh, I you know practicality. I like takeo. You know, very practical weapon. Um, you know, it's it, now it's about. The translation Ruku Kobodo Hosen Shinko Kai is the Okinawan uh, Weapons Preservation Society. And now we're trying to preserve this history of, of what the weapons were and how they were taught. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's not about using a weapon as a self-defense implement. It's true that you could pick up anything and use it as a self-defense implement, you know, a, a bottle, a magazine, a, whatever. When you understand Kobodo, you understand how everything can be a weapon. But, you know, no one's walking around the street with a paracama in their gi, or hopefully not. <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's my, my weapons influence, as well as I, I trained many years with Shane in Kobodo, Shane Igashi. And then um, Judo was originally with... Uh, a number of teachers, eventually Don Mia, fantastic teacher. He was a, he was a teacher by profession. Uh, one of the best children's teachers I've ever seen. The classes were packed, the energy was high. Uh, terrific teacher and also Fred Okimura. Now, Fred Okimura uh, was the founder of the Cytokan in Montreal. If you've ever heard of Doug Rogers who won a silver in 64 Olympics, Fred was his teacher. And then uh, Okimura Sensei uh, moved into Iaido. So I had trained just a little bit with him in Judo, but when I, I started training with him regularly in Iaido, and marvelous guy, you know, fantastic teacher, eighth Dan in Judo, uh, widely recognized across the country as one of the pioneers of Judo in Canada, and, uh, and had just a sensational time learning from him. And then unfortunately, business transferred me back to Toronto. And so I wasn't able to continue continue my Yaido with Okimura and he passed away, gee, it's probably eight to 10 years now, but another great influence. Uh, Shane Higashi, you know, fantastic influence in karate. Um, you know, after so many years, you've seen a lot of things and I would rank Shane in the top one or two in terms of bunkai. Uh, when it comes to the application of the technique, 
uh, just outstanding, uh, you know, real understanding of balance and timing and, and so on. And uh, so that also perhaps to give you a description, originally under the uh, National Karate Association, there was Soroka Sensei's banner. And he had a number of senior students that left him to start the Canadian Karate Association in uh, Ottawa and whole Quebec. And uh, so Andre Langelier was one of his, I think Sandans, he split, Fern Clareau, George Sylvain. Uh, if you've ever heard of uh, George Sylvain, he's also a very senior ranked jujitsu practitioner. Yeah. And so when they split into the Ottawa Hall area and they started the Canadian Karate Association, um, they had, uh, I would say pound for pound, some of the toughest guys I've ever seen. And, and I mention this not in terms of personalities you necessarily want to emulate. <laughs> they, they had issues. They're, they're all going to be ticked at me now. But, but you can't take away uh, the extraordinary fighting skill they had because for many of them, fighting was their nighttime pastime. Let's go into a bar and, and you know, pack it out. So you knew if ever you got in the ring with one of these guys or any of their, their students, uh, fighting was not a point experience. Um, anyway, they had, they had the Canadian Karate Association and eventually that, that split to Fern Clarou's Association, another phenomenal martial artist. And, uh, and so that was my first 10 years. So my first 10 years of training was in that environment. And then when I went to Shane and the, the uh, World Chitoryu Federation, they were very much technically oriented. So fighting wasn't really, you know, the aspect. They were, they were folks that like to attract academics, attract professionals, have an environment that, that um, was very safe, and, uh, and a lot of concentration on technique. And I, I give them full credit. I, I learned a tremendous amount. Uh, I went to Japan a few times to train with Soke, who was Dr. Shitose's son, Yasuhiro. He took his name, Tsuyoshi, uh, who I still say is the best technician I've ever seen. Uh, he was raised from birth by his dad and uh, just had really beautiful technique. Suspect he's never been in a fight in his life, <laughs> but beautiful technique. And, uh, and so th there was this double influence of, you know, the, the importance and practicality of fighting and then with the Chitoryu Federation, the importance and, and focus on technique and bunkai and kata and understanding the art. And so I feel very fortunate that I had both. And then my third influence was Mike Foster. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of, of Mike Foster. Yes, He's I a, have. Yeah. Uh, you know, an extraordinary man. And he, uh, you know, he was over in the 1950s in Japan with the U.S. military, eventually trained with... Uh, Mamoru Yamamoto, who was the, the senior student of Dr. Shitose. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, uh, Mamoru Yamamoto had been a three-time All Japan champion. He was a six foot tall Japanese, long black hair down with shoulders. He was, he was like, anything anyone did, he did a little better. Yeah. And, and uh, Mike Foster was training with a uh, uh, Gojiryu teacher called Watanabe who by the time Mike had hit second end, you know, Mike's six foot five, he's a big guy. Mm -hmm. And what Nabby said to him, you know what, you, you need to be training with Yamamoto. So he introduced them and then Mike was with Yamamoto for most of his career till he started his own association in Florida. Uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, martial artist. Uh, I've often said the best Caucasian martial artist I've ever seen. And, uh, uh, you know, full credit to his fighters. Uh, he had a group, a group of black belts that, uh, again, I felt like I was back in my early days. Every single guy there was a really competent fighter. And he had many of the students go on and win kickboxing championships and boxing championships and so on, because they had that type of rigorous training that they could handle it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm... Um... Yeah, I, I'm I'm somewhat familiar with with uh, Sensei Foster and also um, uh, Yamamoto Sensei. Um, you know, just because of the similar lineage, you know, through Chito Ryu and 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 the like. Um, one thing I've always wondered, and because I and 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 forgive my ignorance, but I, I 
I think you're probably the best person that I've spoken with so far that can answer the question. Yoshukan versus Yoshukai. Yeah. Is there, is, is there a difference? Is, is it the same, one and the same, just two different ways? I, I know that the difference between the words Khan and Kai, but Yoshukan, Yoshukai, I'm, I'm just curious as to sure. how that falls. Uh, well, first thing is uh, I have two answers for it. Okay. Uh, can means like house, Kai means neighborhood. So when you're, when you're, uh, when your own house, you're can. Mm -hmm. Yose can, Yoshu can, it means you've got this small organization. If it continues to expand at some point, it's a Kai. Uh, when Yamamoto left Dr. Chitose, he started the Yoshu Kai. Yoshu means uh, like school of continuous improvement. So he started the Yoshukai, but of course, you know, he was an eighth dan under Dr. Shitose before he left. So much of what he did was Chitoryu influence. Uh, Yamamoto, being the fighter he was, was also very influenced by Kyokushinkai. And so when I look at modern Yoshukai, I, I see a lot of similarities between not just Chitoryu, but also the Yoshukai influence in their kumite practices and so on, leg kicks, mm -hmm. all that type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, Yoshukan is just a combination of Chitoryu and Yoshukai, which are my two main influences. And so, you know, at, at the time when I started the association, I had a, a sixth dan in Yoshukai, I had a sixth dan in, in uh, Jikishin Ryu, which is Chitoryu. And uh, I approached the uh, National Karate Association. They have something called the Senior Technical Committee which is made up of uh, seven or eight of the most senior teachers in the country for each system. So Shane Agashi was on that. And uh, I don't think Kenzo Dezono was on it, but Alex Waith from Water Ryu was there and Seito for Shito Ryu and Soroka, Soroka Sensei and so on. So I had to do a, a written exam and a physical exam uh, to receive style recognition, uh, which we did. And that's very important to me because you know, in the course of my life, I've come across people that, you know, they've trained 10 years or they have a second Dan and I'm starting my own system. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, when you say, well, why do you think you're ready to do that? They'll say, well, you know, Bruce Lee did it. And I'll say, you know, Bruce Lee was a sixth Dan before he split away. You know, he, he was already a very senior teacher in an art before he created Jeet Kune Do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Getting this recognition was very important to me personally, and I think to our students and association, because it means our diplomas are recognized, our system is recognized, and, uh, and there's a, quite a bit of research that went into it. You know, the Chitoryu background is, is interesting to me because only in Canada is Chitoryu considered one of the five major systems. The rest of the world, it's not. Yeah. And the reason is because these other systems astutely would send teachers out into Europe and Britain and US and so on. They would send them out, fund them, and they would build their local systems. And Chitoryu didn't do that. So when I've been training in Japan, in Chitoryu, uh, we would do a class in the morning with Soke, often 6 a.m. till 8 a.m., that type of thing. We'd have another class at lunchtime. But every night I could go visit another dojo. And all of these phenomenal senior teachers, eighth dan, ninth dan, were all in this small area of Kumamoto. Mm -hmm. And you could go train with each of these different teachers and, and learn from them. So as a student in Japan, it, it was a great experience. As a system, they weren't very astute in terms of building a worldwide organization. Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of interesting um, that because Higashi Sensei has, has done probably more than anybody else in the proliferation of Chito Ryu around the world, like Australia, um, in Europe, um, Norway, um, um, other places, and a number of his former students have gone, you know, to places like Scotland and Romania and Hong Kong and places like that to, uh, to um, you know, spread the style kind of thing, so. Yeah, well, actually a few of those were my students. Oh, and you're a student. Okay. So the, the Hong oh, Kong dojo, the Iceland dojo, Singapore were all associated through me. But regardless, regardless, it's what happens with an art. People reach a certain level, they go out, they expand, and they build the system. Um, 
uh, fortunately in my business, I've, I've often had national responsibilities. And the consequence is that uh, I'm, I'm often going back and forth across the country. And it gave me the opportunity to visit other dojos and train with other people at each part of this, this country. I was, I was uh, stationed in uh, New Brunswick at one point and there happened to be a Chiriu dojo. So I was able to train with them uh, for a little over a year and so on. So, you know, when that happens, there's always cream that rises to the top. Mm -hmm. You know, you go into an area, you train 20, 30, 40 people. There's always a couple when you leave that say, well, I, I want this to continue. And then they become affiliated and associated. And then depending on their, their skill sets and energy level and drive and so on. I, I have a student in Quebec. I went back and forth between Toronto and Montreal uh, a few times for business. And uh, the last time I left, uh, one of my, and I, I wasn't sure who was going to take over. I had, I had, you know, probably a dozen black belts at that point. And one of my students, you know, rose to the top and here it is 40 years later. And she's one of the most senior uh, practitioners in the country. Her name's Louise Provache. Yes. Louise yep. has, uh, you know, six Dan Renchi grade. She's got NCCP level five with the exception of maybe Norma Foster. I think she's the only woman in Canada that has that level, which is an Olympic level coaching in, in our arts. Yep. Uh, she's got a great crew of black belts she's developed and she also was inducted in the, the Hall of Fame as she should have been. So sometimes yeah. that happens that, that, you know, certain students rise up and continue the dojo. So yeah. over, over your um, many decades of, of practice and training and so on, um, have there been, I'm sure there have been, but I don't want to assume, um, what would you say have been the probably the most prominent eureka moments um, in, in terms of your, you know, sudden understanding of, of either concepts or, or technique or, you know, the, the, the practice as a whole within the system and so on. Sure. Anything, anything well, you can share on that? There's eureka moments physically, technically, and there's eureka moments philosophically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can tell you physically, I, I often tell my students, I was a, uh, I was a third Dan for six years. And what I learned in those six years was one inch. And they say, Sensei, what are you talking about? I say, you know, it took me six years to realize that this or this made a big difference to the overall technique. Just that extra little ikite, that extra little extension on everything you're doing mm -hmm. gives you that extra little, you know, movement. And, but it took six years. And that's what happens with, with martial arts training is your learning curves like this when you start. And then it starts to plateau and then you plateau for three months and then jump up and plateau for six months and jump up. Yep. So, uh, you know, I, I had to plateau for six years. Maybe I'm stupid. But, but it took that long to really appreciate how that extra little torque in a movement, whether you're blocking, striking, what have you, can have such a profound difference. And Mike, Mike Foster told me once he was doing a six Dan exam with Dr. Chitose and he wasn't doing something quite right. And Dr. Chitose came over and, you know, asked Mike to punch him. And he, he did this inside block and Foster since he was telling me, you know, a month later, his whole arm was still bruised. Uh, you know, it's that extra little movement. Mm -hmm. I, I want to mention something about the Dr. Chitose because I, I was fortunate to train with him uh, on, on a number of occasions. And I've got tremendous respect for, uh, for what he built. I mean, you just have to take a look at some of the senior students he's produced in the association and, and give him full credit. But some people, you know, turn that into mythology. You know, I remember when he was a 62 year old man and he was in Toronto at the time, he was doing his last tour and he, and he uh, you know, did a demonstration for us. And you know, 82 year old man, I should say. 82 I said that ah, good for him but I'm listening to some of the other teachers around me saying did his feet even touch the floor he, you know he glided into the gym and I'm thinking how does that hysteria happen that you know people start not seeing reality mm -hmm. but then I realized if he's a god they're a demigod <laughs> right if he's if he's that special then they must be that special and none of us are we're just people that 
found a passion, we work hard at it. And, you know, where we can, we positively influence the lives of others. But some of the other stuff that gets floated around, I, I've been all over Asia, all over North America, I've taught in Europe. There's no magic. There's will. There's certainly will. I used to watch Fern Carew breaking bricks, even when he was sitting in a wheelchair. Uh, and a feat that I couldn't replicate today. And I say, man, that man has an iron will. It's not magic. So you mentioned that there's two kinds of eureka moments, you know, yes. philosophical and physical. Um, yes. I can imagine after, you know, over 50 years of training, um, you know, the way that you've trained, uh, the way that you practice and so on has, has had to evolve as well. So can, can, can you speak to some of the physical uh, oriented eureka moments you've had? to modify or, or um, adjust your training um, accordingly, or, ha or have you? Maybe you've, been, maybe you've been fortunate and you can keep training like you did when you were in your 20s. Yeah, I, no, I don't, and, and I don't think it's healthy. Uh, I still train regularly. I just finished mm -hmm. the workout before I came to see you. I, I set a goal for myself last year to do Sanchin. I don't know if you know the kata, Sanchin, uh, to do it every day last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was doing pretty well until I had a back operation. And then I, I, didn't, I didn't get to fulfill my pledge, but I'll do it again. It was a great uh, personal exercise. Uh, I've had eureka moments as a fighter. And I've had eureka moments as a technician. Um, you know, one of them is learning how to project key. And I don't want this to sound esoteric. But there's a way when you strike someone that you're not striking the surface, you're actually pushing your energy right into the middle of them and shaking yep. up their internal organs. And uh, I, I spent a lot of time working on that. It was important for me to understand how to do it. And then I, I hit a point uh, when I was about a fourth Dan level where I was hurting people all the time and I didn't want to do it. Like it, it really caused me to sit back and say, hey, that's not, you know, I, I don't want to be hurting people when I'm practicing with them. By the way, in my 50s, I started getting hurt too. <laughs> and then you start saying, well, you know, if, if the only outcome is they're going to get hurt or I'm going to get hurt, maybe it's time to stop, you know, the, the sport aspect of what we're doing. But uh, that, that was a eureka moment for me is understanding how to do that. And I remember distinctly as a fighter uh, hitting a point where I felt I could feel my opponent's heartbeat. You know, you're just into the rhythm and you're feeling their breathing and feeling their heartbeat and your timing gets really, really tight because you've got that degree of sensitivity. I'll give you an example. I, I was very fortunate. Uh, I was able to have uh, training with Joe Lewis, the, the world heavyweight karate champion from the US and with Bill Wallace. And I remember fighting Lewis at one point. And at the time I had a pretty good drop side kick, which is if someone came in and kicked me, I dropped to the ground, kick up into their groin. And I'd used it successfully in competition. And I, I, it was a technique I had a lot of confidence in. And I was set up on Lewis and he was about to come in and I must have done just the tiniest little flinch. And he smiled and he backed up. And I thought, oh, son of a gun. He was, he was so locked in sensitivity wise that even the tiniest little flinch, he knew he was being set up. And he was like that. He was, he, you know, he was bombastic. He'd be, you know, talking to the crowd and the audience. And but as soon as he got in front of you, his eyes were like, you know, camera shutters that went. Shh. And you knew there was nothing else in the room except you and him. He, he was, he was really, he, he was everything he was, you know, purported to be. But, but I'm going to give credit to someone else. You know, having fought, uh, I've fought four world champions at this point. Uh, I still say the toughest guy I ever fought was Ted Youngblood. Really? So if ever you get a chance to interview Ted, uh, he, uh, uh, he was Soroka's guy, uh, Canadian champion many times over. Uh, I was at a camp with Peter Giffen when I was a third den. Third den, I was you know, pretty fit, pretty strong. And uh, I saw Ted Youngblood at a camp. He'd been on my examination board. And I said to Peter, 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 I, I want to fight with Ted. He said, come on, come on. So he took me over and he said, uh, Sensei, I would like to spar with you. Kids. Sure. It's the only time in my life I've had a guy pick me up with one hand and shake me while he hit me. <laughs> you know, he was just extraordinarily strong and fast. Uh, and 
I, I was more of a point fighter. So I would score points on Ted. But when he scored a point on me, he and I both knew it was a kill. Mm-hmm. In other words, it had such control and command of speed and power. You know, I bowed to him at the end and I thought, man, that, like that guy is primo. And, you know, he's a Canadian. So, of course, he never gets the same press as a lot of the American guys do. But, you know, the reality is that, that he's right up there with the best of the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, others have mentioned that uh, it would be it would be a real score if I could get him on here as well, because uh, he, he was quite a phenomenon for sure. Well, in, in my dojo, we had uh, Dominic Pitto and, uh, and Peter Giffen, who were both mm-hmm. on the national team at the time. And they were training with Ted. And uh, they said, you got to come see him. And I said, well, you guys are on the national team. They said, we're no comparison. So, you know, when you have people of that caliber talking about someone like that, you know that they're in a class of one. You know, do you have or have you developed or, or, or identified, you know, a favorite concept or a favorite technique that exemplifies uh, that, that favorite concept uh, with regard to either the system in which you are currently training and teaching or um, um, just within within a situation? Um, if you're encountering somebody on, on the tatami and, and uh, you know, there's a, if, did you have a go-to, a go-to technique or, or yeah. concept? That, yeah, okay. yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's less about a technique. Um, you know, the, wherever you start, there is a point where all the truths collide. <laughs> you know, whatever system you start with, whatever orientation you have, there's a point where things just become evident. Uh, one, of, one of the most evident elements for me I ever referenced is sensitivity. You know, when you, when you position yourself off someone else, you should immediately, through your, all your antennae, understand, are they left-handed, right-handed? Where's the weight? Is the back foot up on the ball of foot? Are they turned into Hanmei shoulders? What weapons can they fire from there? Like, there's, there's so much you pick up from that picture. And that's sensitivity, number one. And then number two is distance. It does not matter how powerful the person is or how fast the person is if you're out of their range. And, and distance only happens through footwork. So a, as a fighter, I, I used to skip rope an awful lot. I used to do a lot of uh, tons of bag work, uh, a lot of uh, shadow boxing, because your ability to move from point A to point B is absolutely critical to winning a fight. Can you get out of their range so that whatever they're throwing misses, can you get back in their range so that you can fire off what you want to fire off? Mm-hmm. I had an experience as a brown belt. I, I uh, you know, mo- most of the old guys like me, we had early competitive success. It, it probably was a good ego boost for us. And so as a brown belt, I was winning all the time. And then there was this, this guy from a Taekwondo school in Montreal that beat me. And then I fought him again and he beat me and I couldn't figure it out. So I, I put on a hoodie and I went down to his dojo and I sat in the back and I watched how they trained. And I realized that what they did is they would do a forward series of combinations, boom, 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 boom. And then they'd stop and they'd walk back. And then they do it again, boom, 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 stop and walk back. And I realized if you're in front of him while he's doing one of those combinations, he's really good. But if he has to fight going backwards, they didn't practice that way. So sure enough, I, you know, I, I fought for a black belt championship. I was up against him again and I beat him. And I know he was leaving thinking, I thought I could beat this guy. <laughs> but it's, it's you fight the way you train. And in their particular case, they trained full speed ahead, nothing defensively. Mm. So epiphany, sensitivity, distance. Uh, I picked up a lot in Kumite from uh, Mike Foster. He's a very innovative guy. He came up with a lot of innovative concepts, weapons online, staying out of the hole, uh, flinching forward, things things that were unique to his practice of the arts. He was a thinker. (coughs) And all of those are very practical. They're embedded into the Yoshukan system. Uh, I've actually instructed my black belts. You don't teach these outside of our school. This is for us. Mm -hmm. You never know who you're going to meet. This is for us. 
So, uh, you know, there, there are a variety of those permutations and combinations, but at the end of the day, number one is if you don't have sensitivity, you're going to be on your ass. And number two, if you haven't got mobility, you're going to be on your ass. Now, whether or not you win the fight is going to come back to something uh, one of the senior Cheeto guys taught me once. He used to work in, in lumberjack camps. And, you know, when they've had enough beers, they'll sit on a bench and take turns punching each other to see who lasts. You know, like <laughs> these aren't self-actualized citizens. And uh, he said, never forget, it's not who can give the most punishment, it's who can take the most punishment. And most martial artists don't train to take punishment. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's great to practice in front of the mirror. It's, it's great to hit a heavy bag. But you, you also need to learn you know, how to snap with the punch, how to roll, how to bob, weave. None of these techniques are taught in our katas, but we have incorporated them in the Yosha camp. Yeah, and, and I guess it, these are things you can only learn through interacting with another live body, right? It's not something that you can, you know. You know, it's very difficult. When I, when I trained with Lewis, uh, and he, he was my, my athletic hero growing up. You know, I'd see him in all the magazines, and, you know, he was powerfully built, 21 inch neck, looked like a Mr. America. And after we sparred, I was in the dressing room with him and I said, Sensei, Sensei, what's the secret? He says, what secret? I said, what's the secret to being a better fighter? And he looked at me and said, fight every day. Mm -hmm. And I was crestfallen. I thought, that's it? And of course, you know, as I thought about it months after month, he was absolutely right. You want to be a better golfer, golf every day. You want to be a better yeah. painter, paint every day. You want to be a better fighter, fight every day. And most people don't. Yeah, so. it's a skill. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a skill. So in, in your opinion, switching gears a little bit here, um, you know, your, your, your pedigree, your background is, is comprised of a number of different styles and, and, and uh, systems and so on. In your opinion, are styles relevant? In terms of, you know, one being more uh, yeah. effective than another in certain situations or? Well, let's, let, let's go back a little. Originally, there were no styles. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you go back, uh, you know, 150 years, there weren't styles. You know, most of the art that we practice today was Okinawan based. And there were, you know, ostensibly five major teachers that went to Japan. And the reason they went to Japan was twofold. One, they were starving. Like literally, they were starving. They'd have 10 kids and five of them would die from starvation. So, you know, going to Japan became a, a money funnel for them that they could pass money back to their families and they could survive. And over time in Japan, their students started identifying their system. I'm with Funakoshi Sensei. This is the can of Shoto. Shotoke. I'm with Otsuka Sensei. I'm with uh, Miyagi Sensei. So they, they started identifying the teachers just like Chitoryu. Now, I don't know if you're aware, but that Chitoryu crest you wear was originally the Zenipon Karate Do Renmai. And so they were all part of this karate association in Japan in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, when they all started developing their own house and crests, Dr. Chitose kept that crest and just changed the the kanji in the middle to Chito Ryu. Mm -hmm. so, so there were no systems. And of course, 150 years ago, there was no competition. There was no sport. There was no trophies. Uh, it was really, uh, I'm coming home with chickens tonight to feed my family. And if the bandits get the chickens, then my family starves. So I, I need to survive. Um, interestingly, by the way, is most of them trained Kobura. Karate was, was secondary. You know, they, they trained Kobodo, and then if the weapon got knocked out of their hand, then they had to know how to do kumitachi, how to grab and strike and so on. So uh, as the art evolved from Okinawa to Japan and the systems proliferated, and then from there, it started going out globally around the world, including to Canada, uh, then the systems were in place. But two things about North Americans. First is we're very eclectic. So we would go to a tournament and we'd see someone do something and we'd say, hmm, how do you do that? 
you know, I, I was telling my students yesterday, I was doing advanced black belt training. I was saying, you know, when I started, a front leg roundhouse kick was considered an advanced black belt technique. Spinning back kick wasn't part of our curriculum. It was, it was just not part of the curriculum. So what happens is we would start to experiment and steal and train and cross fertilize this information to the point that we, we ended up with, I'll say 20 years ago, these systems. And then we had a huge slap in the face called MMA. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I give credit to MMA for getting, you know, a little dose of reality put back into what we as martial artists do. Because I was a judoka and a karateka, when I fought, if you got close to me, you were going down and we're on the mat. That's just how we train. Um, but most martial artists aren't like that. They're either ground people or they're striking people. And MMA has said, you better have both. Mm -hmm. Now, I have an issue with MMA. There's a whole level of ethics in the martial arts that needs to be taught. In other words, as you start to develop these skills, you also have to develop your appreciation of humanity and sensitivity and respect. Otherwise, it's like giving someone a gun. They, they have no moral compass and you've just given them a weapon that they can kill with. But in martial arts, by the time you develop the skill, you should have also developed the appreciation for the art and the ethics. MMA, unfortunately, is not there. Some schools are trying to do it. I've seen MMA schools where they're giving out belts and diplomas and so on, you know, the, the commercial exercise. But in terms of, of uh, really teaching respect for opponents and, uh, you know, using the skills that you've learned in the dojo to augment your life and to become a, a happier, more well-adjusted person, <laughs> that's, that's not part of the MMA ethos. Mm -hmm. well, it's not core to it, at least. Right. Um, so this actually is a good segue into another question I'd like to ask um, with regard to the role of tradition in, yeah. in training the martial arts. And, yeah. um, you know, I've, I've had conversations with people that, you know, some are, are staunchly in favor of, you know, maintaining the traditions, you know, like the Japanese arts where, where you're bowing and you're, you're using the Japanese terminology for the, for the techniques and, and, and uh, um, other, other, you know, aspects of it. And then others uh, have said that, well, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like LARPing, you know, like live action role-playing it's, it's a uh, cultural appropriation. It's not really genuine if it's done outside of Japan. And I'm right. curious as to, as to what your thoughts are on, on that. Uh, well, a couple things. Um, I've often seen North American dojos doing four times the etiquette they do in, in Japan. <laughs> you know, they, they, don't, they don't bow in the dojo, bow to the teacher and get going. You know, they're bowing and then bowing and bowing and then bowing and bowing. It, it's, like, it, it's, it's, it's so far removed from what the purpose of the rei is. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, I believe in tradition. Uh, you know, I think, I think being involved in something that is global, that has, again, an ethics to it and uh, has a tradition to it that reinforces a belief system, it's all good. But let's not go overboard. I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, first time I trained with Mike Foster and, and he came up to Montreal and I had a, a class there of, of uh, you know, probably 20 or 30 people. And when we bowed, we, we bowed and we said, us. And he turned and looked at us and he said, why are you ussing a wall? <laughs> he said, well, well, that's how we've always done it. He said, you don't us a wall, you us a person, right? And then when we, we went to bow, we slapped our hands against our gi as we bowed. And he said, he turned around and he said, why are you slapping your hands on your gi? He said, well, we thought that's the way it's done. He said, no, don't tell me where your hands are. You know, it's, it's some, sometimes we can get carried away with tradition. Mm. And, and quite frankly, my training in Yaido, in the Muso Shinden Ryu style, I don't know if you, want, you know Yaido at all, but it's, it's the drawing of the Katan, right? Yep. And one of the things that really reinforced my learning in Yaido, and I did Yaido to improve my karate, 
is every single little thing in the item has a reason. There's nothing they do. You know, the big toe moving here, the little finger moving here. There's nothing they do in Yaido that isn't based on live or die. If you're fighting someone with a three foot long razor blade, everything you do is very, very specific. And uh, karate, unfortunately, in some cases, and, and I think this is because often the teachers are actually students of a student of a student of a student. They've gotten far away from the, from the core is they're adding more and more of these elements to the art that in fact, real karate, uh, it should be like a, a marble sculpture. You know, the art's inside the marble and now you're chipping away all the unnecessary stuff. And, and you know, many cases people have taken a piece of marble and they keep adding more and more marble to it yeah. to create the statue. So technically everything we do um, has that element to it that, that there's a reason, there's a purpose. The art gets taught this way. So in your opinion, um, what does a shodan signify to you? Like somebody earning their, earning their first, first dan black belt. Um, what, 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 what does that mean in, 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 from your perspective? You're ready to be taught. So it's, it's more of a mindset versus a skill set, or is there a, a maturity level that's required as well? Or You know, it's, it's not so much that as, you know, of course, North America, particularly media, television, newspapers, so on, we, we made the black belt to be something special. Mm -hmm. It's not. In Asia, it's not. All it means is, okay, now, now you're ready to learn. You, you've got to first hand level, uh, now you're ready to learn the art. Uh, you know, one of the, the biggest disappointments of my life, which I've now, now uh, climatized myself to, is you train with the student five or six years, they get a black belt, and then they're gone. Because they feel like, oh, I've done. I'm there. <laughs> and, you know, you're, you're not remotely there. But I guess you fulfilled your parents' expectation of you getting a black belt and your friends and this goal you set for yourself and then they're gone. Now, listen, martial arts isn't for everyone. Everyone, everyone finds their own passion, whatever it is. Hopefully they do. But nonetheless, you know, shodan just means, you know, you're, you're ready to start the path. You so know, I've got, it, it's I, I've start, got it's not a the number of, of senior students. And, and when I think about the 40 or 50 years we've been together, I mentioned, Louise Provence, Rob Kalinowitz, who still runs the NDGY 50 years later, uh, Joko Villaloni uh, in Ontario, uh, Omer Gojak, uh, you know, these, these, are, these are students, Charles Mayer, these are all fourth, fifth, sixth stand level students. They have been through so many ups and downs in their lives because that's life. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, martial arts is, is not something that goes like this. Martial arts is how do you weave it with your life, your career, your family, and so on, but maintain it as a passion where you want to keep learning and growing. And for the students that, that understand that formula, then they're still with you 40, 50 years later. But along the way, you've lost a lot of folks. Yeah. And, and that actually touches on, on, um, on uh, another thing uh, I was going to ask is... You know, you're talking about some people, they, they stick with you for the long haul. Others, you know, you, you get them until a certain level and then they drop off. And, uh, you know, everybody's got their own reasons for doing what they do and so on. Um, is there anything um, that, you know, looking back on your 50 plus years uh, of doing this, is there anything that if you could do it over again that you would have changed? Yeah. Yeah, I, it, it, it's funny. I'm, I'm, I'm really opening up to you here, Charles. Good job. <laughs> uh, I used to be more critical of other people in the arts. You know, uh, I was, I had friends who were boxers. I was critical of boxing, even though I ended up doing my NCCP in boxing and loving it. It's, it's terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had friends competing that I thought, I thought, you know, what they were doing wasn't quite appropriate and, and so on. I look back now and, and I, I feel like, girl, shut up. You know, it's a big tent, martial arts. 
And it's a tent that's big enough. If someone only wants to do their kata, let them do their kata. If someone only wants to fight, let them fight. If someone only wants to do, you know, you know, ground game, let them do the ground. Like it's a big enough tent that I think, and I hope our generation uh, is far more uh, tolerant and respectful of all the different perspectives in martial arts. And maybe, maybe I came late to that table because I was young and competitive and, and driven. But, uh, but now I meet anyone with any type of martial arts background. And I'm always you know, appreciative of the fact that somewhere they've let the arts into their life. And that tells me a bit about the type of person they are. So do you think that comes with maturity or do you think it comes with you know, education or maybe a bit of both? Uh, you know, look, it's, 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 it's not for me to say, uh, other than to say at this point, after, you know, being involved in the arts all over the world, uh, and so many outstanding people, I, I often say, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I mean that sincerely, you know, when I think about how blessed I've been to have Fred Okimura and Shane Agashi and Chido Se Sensei and Mike Foster and uh, you know, Paul Brown, my judo sensei, fantastic teacher out of Peterborough, Ontario. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just blessed uh, that, that I've been able to find these people and that they've, they've allowed me to learn from them. And, and uh, you know, that's again why I applaud you doing this project. Uh, is This is history. This is, you know, how the arts were formed. And uh, I, I hope that every other martial arts teacher shares my my uh, perspective that producing a tough student uh, is nice, but producing someone that's a good member of society that you know lives a happy, fulfilling life, that's gold. That's mm -hmm. really. I think you've answered pretty much everything that I had to ask of you uh, today. So really, really uh, appreciate your time. Um, is there anything that you wanted to add that we haven't covered? Like um, where can people find you or your association or your? Um, well, if they go on YouTube and they look up Yoshu Pan Karate, uh, we have a number of, you know, uh, videos up there. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to my family who've been part of everything I've done. My wife is a fourth Dan, my daughter, Renee, a third Dan. My wife's name is Betty. She's been to Japan. She's, you know, run her own school. My son, Jake, is a second Dan. Uh, he's, a, he's a professional musician and he's really good. Uh, but if he wasn't that, he'd be an MMA fighter. He's a tough kid. So, it, you know, everything, everything we do is oriented towards our family and our community. And, uh, and I, I think that's part of our role as whatever leadership mantle we carry, that we live lives uh, that can positively influence the lives of others. Excellent. Excellent. Well, again, uh, thank you so much. I, I sincerely appreciate your... Uh, agreeing to come on and, and, and share your, share your wisdom, share your thoughts and experiences. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I think those who watch this will, uh, will gain something from it. I know I have, I've been making notes the whole time. So. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care.